Okay, yeah, thank you, Oscar, and uh, welcome back. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, yesterday I mostly surveyed uh, some uh, some phenomena on uh, super, uh, superconductivity in in uh, a, a untwisted a bilayer and a ABC trilayer graphene. Uh, you heard some more from from Stevan. Uh, today I'm mostly going to talk about theory. Okay, so. Uh, uh, yesterday, yes, I think what I told you was all true. Uh, today, I'm gonna, uh, I, I can't necessarily make that statement. I, I think it's all, it's all gonna be theoretically true, uh, okay, but whether, to, to what extent that uh, any of that applies to the actual materials uh, is, is yet to be seen. I, th I think that uh, superconductivity in these systems is far from being a solved problem. Um, but uh, we're going to take one particular or two particular routes and just see where it leads, where it, it, it uh, where, where they lead us. So uh, yeah, so a, a, just a brief, a brief recap. Okay, so we have these uh, different superconducting states, even within the same system. You can have different uh, superconducting pockets, as you saw. Just learned about SC three, also working somewhere around here. Okay, and uh, a, a, what we saw is that uh, interestingly. In the trilayer, uh, you can have uh, two superconducting regions uh, within the same phase diagram. One is a si spin singlet, and the other one is spin triplet. Okay, so remember here, spin orbit coupling is small. It makes sense to distinguish them; they're not strongly mixed, and the system can choose, and it chooses triplet for uh, for the smaller one, for SE2, and singlet for the more uh, robust one. There's a small caveat. There's a caveat on that that I'll mention as we go along. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and we also mentioned that uh, uh, many of these phases seem to occur right at the, at the verge of an instability towards another phase, where, where the normal state becomes unstable towards another phase. Not all of them, okay? Actually, the most robust one in the bilayer uh, is not. Okay, and, and we also commented that these uh, materials, importantly, are very, very clean. Uh, um, in terms of the superconducting state, they're in the so-called clean limit, okay? The, the mean free path is is longer and sometimes much, much longer than the coherence length. And that, why, why is that important? Okay, we know that uh, a unconventional superconductors, uh, but basically anything but this wave, anything where uh, the average of the order parameter, all the Fermi sheets uh, is zero or nearly zero, is expected to be very sensitive to the presence of non-magnetic impurities. And th that was demonstrated beautifully in strontium ruthenate, okay, where uh, it really follows up because of uh, Gorkov theory, and in particular when the mean free path becomes of order of the coherence length, uh, superconductivity is destroyed. And let, let me just emphasize that uh, if you calculate what's the mean free path at this point, it's actually very long, okay? So it's still a very clean metal. The, the mean free path here is a thousand angstroms, okay? So still hundreds, hundreds of unit cells. And nevertheless, it's amount to have this amount of impurities to destroy superconductivity. And it would be wonderful if there would be a controlled way of course, it's very non-trivial, but to, to have a controlled way to introduce disorder. So we worked so hard to get these beautifully clean system. Now we should think about how to make them more dirty. Okay, so, so uh, this, this is, a, I think, a very, very uh, useful and powerful probe. Okay, so uh, puzzles, there are many, but I wanted to highlight uh, a couple. Okay, so uh, we want to know the mechanism. If it's electron phonons, we discussed how a, there should be a relation between lambda um, the, uh, the superconducting lambda, okay, the, the dimensionless coupling constant that goes into the BCS formula, and um, the uh, a, a, a dimensionless electron phonon coupling constant that goes into the temperature dependence of the resistance in the normal state above a characteristic phonon frequency called the uh, block Grunheisen frequency, which is basically uh, twice speed of sound times KF. Okay, and, uh, and indeed, there is a region where the uh, resistance grows linearly with temperature, but the slope is way too small to explain the observed TC. Okay, so that's puzzle number one. Uh, and uh, usually these two coupling constants are similar, within 30% in, in conventional metals. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about puzzle number two, and that is in the BN samples, where the system has a choice, what is it gonna choose? Is it gonna be spin singlet or spin triplet? Now, it turns out that that problem is particularly subtle and interesting in these graphene systems. And the reason is the following. It's, uh, it's actually determined, so the fate of the superconductor, whether it's singlet or triplet, is really determined by 
a small energy scale. It's sort of almost an afterthought. So you would sort of expect singleton triplet to always be close in energy and a, a, a relatively small energy scale in the system, namely the so-called Hund's coupling between the valleys is what would determine whether it's singlet or triplet. And I, I want to go through that uh, in some detail because that's sort of very general in any graphene-based superconductor, actually, also in, in the twisted uh, systems. Okay, so why is that? So uh, we always assume that the pairing has zero center of mass momentum, so the pairing is between valley K, K and valley K prime. Okay, one, one, the Cooper pair has one, one electron at K, one at K prime, related by time reversal symmetry. Okay, and then what, what's uh, uh, determining whether the Cooper pair has a spin angular momentum uh, zero or one simply is, uh, is the coupling between the spins of an electron in valley K and valley K prime. Okay, so that's, if you like, that's a term in the, in the uh, microscopic Hamiltonian, which looks like this. Okay, so it's a so-called Huns type term. So it's a Huns coupling between the spin of an electron at valley K and a spin in, uh, at valley K prime. Okay, so uh, now, uh, this uh, coupling, if you think about, uh, about it as scattering of two electrons, say one with spin up and one with spin down, it involves an exchange, okay? So you have to uh, uh, flip the spin in valley K and flip the spin in valley K prime, which is equivalent to scattering the electron with spin up uh, from K to K prime and the spin down vice versa, okay? So that means that this coupling involves a very large momentum transfer, okay? Of the order of the size of the graphene Brillouin zone. Now, uh, this picture is not drawn to scale. Okay, the actual uh, Fermi surfaces at K and K prime for the characteristic densities we're in are tiny compared to the size of the Brillouin zone, maybe one over 20 of this uh, size, or one over 30. Okay, so uh, if you think about the Coulomb interaction, the long range Coulomb interaction in two dimensions, this go like, goes like one over Q, where Q is the momentum transfer. Okay, so uh, basically what you expect is that, at least for Coulomb, a, the Coulomb interaction for scattering without a flipping valley would be 30 times bigger than uh, this term, okay, than the term that involves a large momentum transfer. Okay, so th there is this hierarchy of energy scales that you'll see everywhere in these graphene systems. It's really not special to any of these particular systems. There's a Coulomb scale, which would uh, involve a momentum transfers of order Kf, or a, equivalently, it's, it's, the, it's simply the, the Coulomb energy between two electrons a, 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 where the distance between electron is the average distance, okay? So basically one over square root of the density. A, a, that a, for our system, characteristic, the characteristic densities that comes out to be 20 to 30 millivolts. And a, there is this, uh, a, a, this uh, Huns term that uh, you should think about as large momentum transfer, meaning it's, meaning it's very short range in, in real space, okay? It's almost like a contact interaction. The two electrons have to be very close to each other on the lattice scale to know uh, uh, their relative spins if they come from, from opposite valleys. Okay, and that, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, this uh, naive estimate would give you one millivolt for that, for that term. Okay, so, uh, yes. In the presence of strong kinetic interaction, like in the ground, yeah. it's not a good quantum number. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's, it, uh, in that case, it doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm talking about the case uh, with, uh, uh, on, on, on BN, the BN samples. Okay where spin orbit coupling is weak. Okay, so to see what order I'm gonna ignore it, and, and, and that, that's why I'm talking about singlet, uh, singlet versus triplet. Okay, for, with, um, the presence of, uh, of uh, substrate with strong spin orbit would modify this completely. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, a, so it's basically the sign of this term that would tell you singlet, singlet versus triplet. Okay, so, so uh, that's what, what, what it'll do if, if, this, uh, if this sign is positive. Okay, that's ferromagnetic. Uh, you would expect to have a triplet pairing. Okay, and if it's uh, a, if it's a negative, you would get singlet pairing. Now, it's actually notoriously hard to predict from fir first principles what this term would be. You would think that from Coulomb, you would you would always get a ferromagnetic interaction. It's just Huns rule, but uh, a phonons also uh, coupling to large Q phonons also contributes to this term, and it contributes to the opposite sign. So it's actually hard to predict uh, uh, what this term would be. Okay, but, um, but actually, uh, I would claim that uh, um, in, uh, in our systems, so uh, a, a ABC trial layer in particular, we actually know what, this, what the sign of this term is. Okay, uh, yeah, let, let me, before go, going on, let me just mention a, an important uh, point. Okay, so if you think about the, the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, you would say, well, there's a, 
there's a clear separation of energy scales here. Okay, so the Coulomb energy is much bigger than this uh, a Huns coupling. So to, to first approximation, let's just neglect the Huns coupling and ask what the resu a, a resulting symmetry of our Hamiltonian is. And it's, it has this symmetry of, the, of course, the U1 charge conservation. But then there's a separate SU2 symmetry for each valley. Okay, and you can rotate uh, the spin in valley K prime uh, relative to the spin in valley uh, K with zero energy cost. Okay, so that's the symmetry of the long range part of the Coulomb interaction. That's a density density interaction. It doesn't care about the relative spin uh, of the two valleys. And only at this uh, a much lower, uh, lower energy scale, you break the, the symmetry down to the physical symmetry, uh, which is uh, U1 charge times U1 valley times SU2. Okay, and in fact, the U1 valley is not really U1, it's actually uh, a only C3. Okay, so that, that, that's uh, um, a. a, a uh, ultimately, there's a locking to the underlying crystal, but that's a much, much, yet, yet, yet much smaller energy scale, and we'll, we'll ignore that completely. Okay, so what's the puzzle? So we would say the following. Well, actually, from the normal state, um, we know that uh, there's a state in the phase diagram, actually, that's the normal state of SC2, where uh, the system is valley unpolarized. Okay, so both valleys are occupied equally, and then uh, if we're looking at uh, this range of energy scales, there's nothing that locks the direction of uh, the spin in valley K prime relative to the spin at valley K. The only thing that does that is precisely this, uh, this Huns coupling. Okay, now we know that that's, that state actually chooses to be ferromagnetic. Okay, so just from that fact, we can deduce that uh, the sign of this uh, Huns coupling J better be positive. Okay, and then uh, um, uh, once the normal state is fully spin polarized, of course, the superconducting state that would descend from that would be a triplet superconductor because there only, there's only, it's a fully spin polarized a, a ferromagnet, metallic ferromagnet, so there's only one spin flavor to pair at the Fermi level. However, SC1 is Pauli limited. Okay, so for, for SC1, the, actually the more robust superconductor in the phase diagram, the normal state is spin unpolarized, so it can choose to, be, to do whatever it wants. Okay, so it has a choice. Uh, if it wanted to be triplet, it would have been triplet, but it seems to be Pauli limited. Okay, so uh, that, uh, uh, that is a singlet superconductor, which would seem to require that J uh, should be negative. Okay, so that's, that's the puzzle. Um, uh, we're scratching our heads a little bit. Now, um, before I tell you our tentative solution, um, let me tell you some caveats. Okay, so the first caveat is, uh, well, maybe the reason uh, the, normal, the, the SC1 seems to be Pauli limited is because of orbital depairing. Okay, so there's an orbital effect of the inner plane field. Um, you would think that's very small because uh, after all, uh, the two layers are, are three angstroms apart. You would think that uh, the, there's very little flux actually penetrating um, um, through, um, between the layers. Uh, but uh, it turns out that the orbital effect actually is not negligible, unfortunately. Okay, so, uh, so that's a caveat. The, I, I don't see a priori a reason why the orbital effect would be extremely different in SC1 and SC2. They actually have you know, similar size Fermi surfaces. So it's not obvious why uh, you know, the, the, uh, 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 the orbital effect would limit TC for SC1 and not for SC2, uh, but that's a caveat to keep in mind. The other caveat to keep in mind is that I'm assuming that J doesn't change sign as a function of density. Okay, so uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, on the implicit biography, for example, yes. similar thing happens that you know, the inner layer, the flux heading to the inner layer in this cell is considerable, and there because the Moyer length scale is used, so the flux heading becomes uh, significant. But here, like the, there is no Moyer length scale. And yes, the, there's no, there's, there's no, why yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, excellent question. So absolutely true. There's no more a, 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 a super lattice here, but what's the relevant length scale? Okay, I would say it's definitely not the inter the intercarbon length scale. It's actually uh, the inter electron length scale. And if you work that out, that's actually quite similar to what to the uh, more size of graphene. Okay, so uh, uh, again, unfortunately, uh, um, yeah. Other other questions? Yes. Uh, question about SC2's normal state. So yes. Next time is, is it known that it's, it, whether it's a ferromagnet or could it be yes. like anti? No, it's a ferro. Okay, so now how, how do you know? Uh, okay, so it, it, it basically, relative to the neighboring phase, it has a very large susceptibility 
uh, for in-plane uh, field. Okay, so you apply an in-plane field, then you ask how you know, there's, there's a neighboring unpolarized phase. You ask how does the phase boundary move? Okay, so uh, if it was an antiferromagnet, you, you would have to start counting it, uh, but it's not. It just goes linearly. Yeah. Yes. There's a, there's a reason for that. So you would say J, J is a microscopic <laughs> interaction. It's a lattice scale interaction. Why, why would it care, you know, two, two electrons are lattice scale apart. Why do we, they care where the next electron is? The, the next electron is 10, 10 nanometers away. They're, you know, two, two angstroms apart. Okay, that's, the, that's my picture. Okay. Um, so, yeah, both of these uh, puzzles uh, lead us to think about electronic mechanisms, and I'm going to dive a little bit on the, into theory. Uh, okay, so it's going to be closely related to what you heard uh, already from Andre and Raphael uh, earlier in the school. Okay, so uh, um, so uh, basically, I'm going to discuss um, uh, briefly two distinct mechanisms uh, for pairing. Uh, both of them are, are electronic mechanisms, so both of them ultimately come from the Coulomb interactions between electrons. I'm not going to involve phonons at all. Phonon might help a little bit, but, uh, but they're not essential. The first one is uh, charge fluctuations. So, okay, so how, how do you get pairing from, from Coulomb interactions? You heard already from Andre. Okay, so the idea is uh, you get this, this huge repulsion between electrons. Definitely two electrons in vacuum are not going to form a bound state by any means. But uh, the electrons are not in vacuum. The electrons are part are uh, living inside this electron liquid, and uh, just like with phonons, okay, one electron <coughs> creates a disturbance in the Fermi C, and uh, that the other electron can feel that dis the disturbance, and that can lead to uh, an effective attractive interaction. Typically, not in the S wave channel, but in the non S wave channel. Okay, so the first mechanism I'm going to invoke is, uh, is just from charge fluctuations, okay? Just from direct Coulomb, a, a, a no exchange, basically, just, uh, a, just ch a charge, charge a, a interactions. One electron leads to a density fluctuations that the other electron sees. I'm gonna call that cone Lattinger. That terminology is not quite precise. We can go into in how, what way. Um, the other mechanism is uh, an exchange of a particular fluctuation. So I'm gonna assume that uh, uh, there are uh, the the uh, uh, in the normal state there are strong fluctuations of an incipient uh, intervalley coherent or IVC phase. Okay, so this is a particular type of order, uh, which is uh, which is basically spontaneous coherence between valley and k and k prime. I'm going to show you what it looks like microscopically. It's some kind of density wave on the on the uh, microscopic carbon carbon scale. Okay, and uh, um, I'll, I'll argue that there are, there are some phenomenological regions to think that at least there, there is an IVC phase, at the phase in the phase diagram. Some of these ordered phases are actually IVC. And I'm gonna assume that there are strong IVC fluctuations even when you're not in the IVC phase. And, uh, a, and then there's an, a, an exchange of a particular type of fluctuation, this IVC fluctuation. A, okay, and uh, interestingly, even though these, uh, these two mechanisms look kind of different, they actually lead to the same symmetry of the order parameter, uh, which is a chiral order parameter. Okay, so uh, this is what the order parameter looks like in a single valley. So uh, you, you, can, you can look at the single valley. The, the, the pairing is always intervalley, so always between k and k prime, but the uh, k dependence of the order parameter within a single valley um, it has this uh, p plus ip form. Okay, so uh, the phase of the order parameter winds twice, winds, winds once when you go along uh, either of the two Fermi surfaces in, in the case of the, of the uh, um, ABC trilayer, which has this annular Fermi surface. Okay, so uh, um, I'm gonna uh, say a little bit more about these two mechanisms, but just uh, that's, a, that's a brief outline. And uh, a two important consequences that follow almost immediately. Okay, the first one is that um, uh, this can resolve the, uh, the, the resistivity problem, okay? So you would say, we said the, the normal state resistance is, is maybe a factor of 50 too small to account for phonons, okay? Now, so now here electrons are still scattering strongly at high temperature. They're just not scattering off phonons, they're scattering off each other, okay? So now uh, uh, that can affect very strongly the lifetime of a single electron, but in the absence of umklapp scattering, remember the density is very, very small, 
Um, that would, the, the total momentum of the electron fluid is almost conserved, so that won't show up in the, in the resistivity. Yeah? I suppose, I, what's the IBC stand for? Intervalley coherence. Intervalley coherence, yeah. Do you have a second order sign on minus? Yeah. No, no, same, same sign. So this is kind of what uh, is why it's called typical standard of I'll, 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 I'll discuss the topology of this state. Uh, yeah. The strength is, is this, uh, for one, is the third order ring uh, interaction strength, which is dimensional. Uh, well, the dispersal of one product. I'll discuss that as well. I'll, I'll discuss that as well, yeah. Just hold, uh, just wait for a couple slides. Yes? Yes, yes, yeah. So, uh, right, so, so uh, let me tell you of my, my uh, version of the uh, terminology. Okay, so what, is, what does it mean that something is chiral? It means that it breaks all mirror. Okay, so your two hands, kind of each, each hand doesn't have any mirror symmetry. The, the, the mirror maps it to the other hand. Okay, so that's chiral. Uh, this uh, order parameter breaks all, all mirror symmetries, and it breaks time versus symmetry, but it's invariant under both. It, it's, it's basically the same symmetry as an angular momentum out of the plane. Okay? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the very same, the, the very same use of the term. And you'll, you'll hear from Marcel more about chiral superconductors. Okay, so, uh, um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I'd claim a, a, if, uh, the dominant interaction is just electron electron, um, it won't show up in the resistivity. Basically, in the system, even at elevated, elevated temperatures, the resistivity would come presumably from phonons or other things, but they might be much, weak, much weaker. The second thing um, is that uh, uh, for both of these uh, mechanisms, even though the sign of the J, the, this uh, inter, inter, inter valley Huns, is ferromagnetic, so uh, when in the normal state, if the system wants to uh, to, uh, to spin polarize, it would like to, um, um, to, to be ferro and not, uh, not anti-ferro. Uh, it turns out that uh, the Coulomb interactions actually favor spin singlet when they, when they can. Okay, if the normal state is not spin polarized, the superconducting state would actually be spin singlet and not spin triplet. That's sort of counterintuitive, but I'll try to show you why. <coughs> All right, so uh, let me go a little bit into the cohn lattinger mechanism. Okay, you heard a little bit about it. Um, so uh, this is this idea. Uh, you basically have the uh, irreducible vertex of interaction uh, between two electrons at p and minus p, okay, the a Cooper channel interaction. The, uh, the bare Coulomb vertex is uh, repulsive, but once you start dressing it, uh, it, it might change sign in a non-S wave uh, channel. Okay, and uh, 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 as uh, Yasha mentioned, uh, there's something special about two dimensions for this uh, mechanism. Um, a, a, a two dimensions is actually particularly disfavorable for, the, for, for this uh, type of uh, a, a mechanism for a parabolic dispersion. The reason is the following. If you look at the, uh, this effective interaction, you see that it contains this particle hole bubble in all, in all, in all these uh, diagrams. Okay, so that's just the normal state, uh, non-interacting susceptibility of the electron gas. And uh, the way you get, a, you get attraction in a non-S wave channel is from the Q dependence of this uh, polarization bubble. Okay, so the idea is the interactions are screened by the electrons, by the, uh, but if they're screened in a momentum dependent way, okay, particularly if this uh, polarization function is a, a pi of Q is very structured, then you'll get that the effective interaction might change sign uh, as a function of real space if you just do a Fourier transform. Okay, but um, in 2D, it's just, as, as you know, there's something very special about a parabolic band in 2D. This polarization function is simply flat, it's simply constant up to 2KF, and then it starts decaying. Now, we care exactly about the effective interaction at momenta between zero, a, a momentum transfer between zero and 2KF, so it's flat exactly where we need it to be structured, to be Q dependent. Okay, so that's very bad. It turns out that, um, Andre uh, um, did a calculation in, uh, in the 90s where he went to the next order uh, beyond these diagrams and found that there is some weak attraction, uh, but, uh, uh, but one needs to uh, remember that uh, our dispersion is very far from being parabolic. Okay, so uh, uh, once you go away from, uh, uh, from the case of uh, parabolic dispersion or you involve multiple subbands, uh, you can get unconventional superconductivity already at this 
at this level. Okay, and the example that would be relevant for us is an example of an annular Fermi surface. Okay, so that's the Fermi surface of the normal state in both SC1 and SC2 in, in trilayer graphene. So that's, uh, that has an outer, there's an outer Fermi surface of holes, an inner Fermi surface of uh, a electrons. Let's assume for simplicity that these Fermi surfaces are circular. Okay, in reality, they're trigonally, uh, trigonally warped. If you just calculate the polarization function for this type of dispersion, you see that uh, there's a lot of structure. Okay, you see all these, uh, all these sharp features. These correspond to the different two KFs you can have in the system. Okay, so there's a KF outer minus KF in, uh, inner. You see this sharp feature, and uh, this is two KF inner and two KF outer. But in, in particular, between zero Q and Q equals two KF outer, you see that there's a very big variation in the in the uh, polarization function, and that's exactly what you need. Okay, so uh, if you just calculate the screened interaction within RPA between two electrons at zero, zero frequency transfer as a function of Q, okay, so this is what it would look like, and is the number of electron flavors, and this is what it would look like in real space. Okay, so this is the bare interaction, just one over R, and, uh, and this is the screened interaction. So you, you see these wiggles, these wiggles come from all this momentum structure. Okay, so the idea is to live off of this attractive part of the interaction. Okay, so that's, that's, what, we, what, that's what we'll do in both SC1 and SC2. As I mentioned, the Fermi surface is annular. And uh, here's our model, very, very simple, just uh, a, this kinetic energy plus a uh, Coulomb interaction, which is screened by two metallic gates. Uh, um, that's, that's what happens in the experiment. Now, uh, these two metallic gates are quite distant. So the, the uh, distance to the metallic gate is, uh, is about four times bigger than the distance between electrons. So they actually don't play a big role here. Very interesting question to ask what, what would happen if you bring these ga gates closer and closer, but uh, we won't do that for now. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Inside the gate. And yeah. The, uh, tangent to tangent ratio could be five, actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, right. So, uh, um, uh, this is a slight cheat. This would be the case if the, uh, the electric extended also beyond here. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I don't think it really matters because the gates are essentially at, 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 at infinity here. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it matters. For, it's true. I don't think it matters for any of the physics that I'm. Well, I mean, if these are perfect metals, then it probably doesn't matter anyway. Then probably we are doing the right calculation. Yeah, yeah, but 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 there's yeah, but but there's there's no electric field outside at all. So 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 then the electric field is all inside anyway. So I, I don't think it really matters. This is a metallic gate. Right, so suppose that this is a perfect metal. The electric field lines don't go outside ever. Yeah, okay, so, uh, right. Okay, so that's, that's, our, that's our model. Okay, so uh, in the, uh, first we're gonna consider this cone latinger like uh, mechanism just from charge fluctuations. Okay, so uh, uh, what we do is, is uh, we dress the, the interaction within the RPA approximation Okay, so uh, basically summing these bubbles, um, and, uh, and this is the uh, result that I showed before. Okay, this is the, the RPA screened interaction, and, and N here is the number of flavors. For SC1, that would be four. Uh, uh, basically, we have the two spins and two valleys. For SC2, that would be two, because we, uh, uh, the normal state uh, um, is already spin polarized, valley unpolarized. Okay, so, uh, so a few things to note here. First of all, uh, this is the interaction, and I've set here explicitly, okay, the, the first um, argument here, um, pi naught is the bare susceptibility. This is the uh, effective interaction at, at frequency transfer omega equals zero. This is the static part of the interaction. Now, we use an approximation, but now we're actually uh, going beyond, uh, which is uh, to assume that this is really a static interaction. Okay, so basically, a, a, the, uh, a, a, a dynamical polarizability of the electron gas definitely depends on frequency, okay? So you know that that leads to, uh, to plasmons, for instance. And uh, as a result, the, the, the effective interaction would be frequency dependent. And then you have to do the 
kinds of things, things that, uh, that Andre described. Okay, you have to solve the Ilya Ashberg equation instead of the BCS equation, and, uh, a, and that can definitely modify things. And it, 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 it actually modifies things in an interesting way, it seems, from, from uh, prelim pre uh, preliminary uh, results. It turns out that uh, the results I'm gonna show you aren't, aren't just washed away when you take into account the frequency dependence, okay? So you still get, uh, you, can sk you can still get similar, similar results, okay? But we, we can talk more about uh, retardation effects. For now, let's just uh, do make this approximation. Okay, and this is what the polarization function looks like in the x and y direction, now taking, uh, taking into account the trigonal warping. Okay, so now it becomes anisotropic, but you, see, you still see this uh, prominent feature that it's much, much bigger up to about the 2kf inner. Okay, and then it starts dropping and it's much, much smaller. It's maybe a factor of five uh, smaller once you get to the 2kf outer of the, of the, of the big Fermi surface. Okay, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the feature you really need. Okay, what, what, what does that mean? So this polarization function is going into the denomin uh, denominator here. So that means that, uh, and, and it's bigger at small momentum, so it, it's, it's largest at small momentum transfer. So that means that the effective interaction is actually a, a weak at small momentum transfer and large at large momentum transfer. Okay, that's, that's the feature that you need to get, uh, a, to get the traction. So the sign is always positive, but if you Fourier transform, you get that uh, it, can be, it can go attractive in a non-S wave channel. Okay, and, and uh, let me make one, one more comment. Of course, we're using RPA where we shouldn't. Okay, so we're using RPA uh, uh, even though RS uh, is not small. Okay, RS is, uh, is five to 10. Um, when can we justify this uh, approach nevertheless? Uh, we have to, uh, to uh, pretend that N is large. Okay, in, in the large N limit, we can actually justify this approach. Uh, this, this is the correct effective interaction. Um, now uh, it's up to you to decide whether, okay, four, uh, four is larger than one, uh, that's definitely true. To say that it's much larger than one maybe is a stretch, but uh, that's, that's what we do, okay? And I think this is, yeah. Uh, is the yes. The yes, excellent question. Okay, so uh, yes, so if you look at V of Q, that's gonna be a positive function, okay? so. Uh, um, it has a positive sign for all, for all uh, a values of Q from zero to two KF. How do you get a, an attraction out of that? Okay, so now uh, you, you, you want to go to, uh, to uh, angular momentum channel M, which is bigger than, than zero. Okay, at, 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 uh, for, for a pair that has angular momentum zero, you simply integrate that function over the Fermi surface. It's positive everywhere. You would get a, a positive result, meaning re repulsion. That's why you would never get S wave out of this mechanism. Okay, you could get S wave as Boris mentioned if you take into account the retardation. Okay, but, uh, but at this level when it's a static interaction you never get the solution. However, now take a M equals one pair. Okay, so now the phase of the order parameter is changing as a function of Q, of, of K on, on the Fermi surface. Okay, and if the interaction is much bigger uh, for momentum 2KF, uh, uh, momentum transfer 2KF compared to uh, momentum transfer zero, and this, the order parameter changes sign exactly for backscattering, then you can win. That's the, that's the key, okay? That's, that's how it works. Great, yeah, so, uh, um, okay, so then we just uh, use this effective interaction as our pairing vertex, okay, uh, the usual, usual ladder summation. Uh, uh, equivalently, we solve the linearized gap equation, um, and this is what we get, okay, so, uh, I'm gonna show you this parameter lambda, which is the dimensionless um, a BCS coupling constant that goes into the exponent. There's a prefactor that I won't try to calculate. There's no other scale in the problem. It's gonna be of the order of EF. Okay, but uh, it might be, there might be a number here, which is probably smaller than one. But this is what lambda looks like as a function of, uh, of whole density. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is assuming that the normal state is unpolarized. This is sort of trying to uh, to get uh, SC1, you see that uh, uh, when the, the whole density is very large, lambda is, uh, is very, very small. Okay, so that's, that's the region where we have just a single large Fermi surface, um, and there, um, there we, uh, uh, we don't get enough momentum structure to get superconductivity. Then you see this jump, that's where we go into the uh, annular regime. Okay, and uh, there's a small uh, density range where the preferred order parameter is this S plus minus, Okay, so it looks like S wave within each 
Fermi surface, but it has a sign change between the Fermi surfaces. But then over most of the density range, um, this is uh, when you vary, your, what you're doing here is basically increasing the relative size of the inner, uh, 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 inner Fermi surface compared to the outer Fermi surface. You see, you see this very large increase in, uh, in lambda, and it has this P wave shape, P wave uh, form within a valley. Okay? And of course, uh, by symmetry, we have C3 symmetry. So Px and Py are degenerate. This is a two-component order parameter of the type that uh, uh, Raphael was, was discussing. Okay? In, a, in a system that has C3, you have an irrep which is two-dimensional, and this is what we'll, we're, we're, we're getting here. Okay? And uh, you see this uh, very large, very sharp peak in lambda. That's the Vanov singularity. Okay? So that's when basically uh, we go from an annulus to three uh, disconnected pockets. And uh, our theory would break down somewhere here. Okay, of course, that's the best place for superconductivity. But uh, at some point, our theory would break down. We would have to do something else. Uh, uh, okay, so we should cut off uh, our calculations somewhere maybe here. And you see that the analysis is not essential. So uh, the superconductivity persists, and it's actually quite strong within this calculation, even in the region where we have three pockets. And the symmetry of the order parameter is the same. Yeah. No, th there is some mixture of higher higher harmonics. Yeah, so it's P wave like I should I should say. Yeah, it's really E. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. What are what are what are what, uh, 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 ah the the uh, harmonics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the trigonal warping that couples them. Okay, and then uh, actually exactly as Raphael was discussing, this is the solution of the linearized gap equation. Uh, to determine below TC, we have these two degenerate solutions, Px and Py. To determine how they combine uh, uh, below TC, we have to uh, go beyond the quadratic order in the, uh, in, in the, in the gap function. We have to uh, calculate this, uh, this box diagram. And um, um, quite generally for a C3 symmetric system, that would give you this chiral solution, Px plus Ipy. Okay, but uh, we always have to remember that a, we, a, 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 another candidate would be the pneumatic solution where you have either Px or Py or some real combination of the two. Okay, so uh, a, now a, let me address, so this is, obviously this is a very interesting order parameter and it should have all sorts of consequences that we can discuss. One immediate question that was already uh, alluded to, is this a topological superconductor? Okay, so we know that uh, a chiral a superconductor um, um, okay, at least breaks the right symmetry to be a topological superconductor. It turns out that uh, for this particular band structure, so we have an annular Fermi surface, uh, the churn number vanishes here. So if you calculate the churn number of the BDG Hamiltonian, that's actually zero. So it's a chiral but non-topological superconductor. The reason is that uh, the outer whole, whole Fermi surface uh, has, uh, contributes a churn number which cancels the, uh, the, the contribution from the inner one, which is an, an electron Fermi surface. Okay, and I won't go into too, too many details, but uh, eh, of course there's nothing special about uh, two or three layers here. We kind of explored what happened for, uh, um, for other stackings up to four layers. Um, eh, and uh, it turns out that uh, ABCA, sort of four layers, that are is now starting to be produced and explored, um, can support superconductivity in a region of parameter space where there's only a single very strongly warped Fermi surface uh, in each valley. Okay, and this would be a topological superconductor. It would have a churn number of two, two from the from the two valleys. Okay, so not quite maybe the topological superconductor we was hoping for. It has churn number one. It's non abelian, but uh, okay, also interesting. Okay, so um, uh, let me discuss a little bit IVC fluctuations. Okay, so different mechanism. Same Coulomb interaction, but sort of a, a different approach uh, that, uh, um, uh, that uh, actually leads to the same symmetry of the order parameter and leads to some other uh, interesting, uh, interesting consequences. Uh, so, um, right, so what is IVC? Uh, okay, so it was mentioned a few times uh, in the school. So um, uh, IVC is an order parameter that uh, involves a spontaneous uh, coherence between valley and k, you know, k and k prime. The order parameter is ck dagger ck prime. Okay, and uh, that order parameter carries a non-zero momentum 
in the, in the graphene Brillouin zone. So that means that in real space, it just involves some kind of uh, density wave uh, on, on the carbon-carbon uh, scale. Okay, and you can imagine different order parameters like that. Okay, so as usual, you can classify the order parameters according to spin. This is what the spin singlet IVC would look like. Okay, so I'm, I'm drawing here a lattice, which is, uh, say, the A sub lattice of the top layer. Okay, remember that uh, the, the A sub lattice and the B sub lattice uh, of the honeycomb lattice, the top layer, are not equivalent. The wave function is mostly living on one of them, so let me pretend I'm, I'm dealing with a triangular lattice. And uh, this is what uh, this uh, intervalley coherent order parameter would look like in real space. Okay, it's, it's simply a density wave. It, it's a density wave that triples the unit cell. Okay, so it's, uh, one, one site has a high density and the two others have a lower density, for instance. Or you can imagine a spin triplet IVC. Okay, a spin triplet IVC is a spin density wave. Okay, so it has this kind of uh, spin modulation with the same wave vector. Okay, so, uh, a, so now suppose we're not quite in the IVC ordered phase, but we're sufficiently close such that there are IVC fluctuations that are strong. Okay, so uh, uh, there are fluctuations of this type of uh, incipient order, e e e either of these two. Okay, and uh, um, so that means that there are strong fluctuations in a wave vector that connects valley uh, K in valley K prime. Okay, so uh, uh, these uh, fluctuations are gonna be particular effect particularly effective if we fold the two uh, Fermi surfaces of the two valleys on top of each other. There are particular points, uh, these are the so-called hotspots, where um, uh, the two uh, sets of Fermi surfaces intersect, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, th these type of fluctuations can resonantly scatter you uh, while remaining on, on the Fermi surface where you're close to these points, yes. No, oh, no, that's, that's yet another thing. So the, the difference is the following. The, the so-called Kramer's uh, or KIVC uh, is always inter sub lattice. So it's, uh, it has structure also in layer and so on. And, and it, it's, it's an IVC because it's inter, inter valley always, but it's also, it, it's also inter sub lattice. Now that's not very relevant here because the two sub lattices are not degenerate. Okay, so uh, in, in, in all these rhombohedral structures, sort of um, the, 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 the important wave functions are living only on one, one sublattice and one layer. When, when you apply, yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, so it's a good question. So uh, that, that one is relevant in, in TBG where you, you, you don't have sublattice polarization. Yeah. I'm just a little confused about where on the phase diagram we are because you mentioned that uh, at least at T2 you're descending out of a pair of magnetic normal state. Yes, yes, right? yes, so. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. So, um, so uh, uh, we, we actually don't necessarily want to be in the IVC phase. We want to be close to an IVC phase, okay, not too far. And it turns out that actually for both SC1 and SC2, there's a neighboring phase, which is uh, not valley polarized um, and not spin polarized. Um, and it's a good candidate to be an IVC. It's not, it's, been, it's not been confirmed to be an IVC, but it's sort of one of the possibilities, okay? Yeah, what, what, what is certain is that in the phase diagram somewhere, there is an IVC, okay? So th there's one region of the phase diagram where I think there's a still circumstantial but pretty compelling evidence that, that there's an IVC phase, unfortunately not close to SC1 or SC2. Okay, all right, so, uh, uh, what do we do then? Suppose we are close to the instability to one of these states. Okay, so uh, we're actually in the, in the non-ordered state, but we're sufficiently close to the instability, so we'll have large fluctuations. So then uh, it turns out that the dominant uh, 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 contribution to the two-particle vertex would be of this form, okay, this funny form, so let me uh, um, uh, walk you through this diagram. Okay, so we have uh, a Cooper scattering, two, two electrons coming in with opposite momenta and two, two electrons coming out. One with uh, a, one a, a, at valley K plus a small deviation P, another one at uh, K prime mi minus P, okay, so time reversed pair. And they interact via this ladder, this particle hole ladder, which is exactly the IVC susceptibility. Okay, that's exactly the dominant uh, contribution to the IVC susceptibility that would diverge if we were right, right at the uh, transition between a non-IVC and an IVC state. Okay, so uh, 
Of course, there are many, many terms that uh, renormalize the two-particle vertex, but only this channel diverges if we're tuned to the, to the transition. Uh, and uh, therefore, we just throw, a, throw out everything else and just treat this, uh, this uh, a family of diagrams, okay? It's, it's actually an in, in, in infinite family. We have to solve the entire ladder here. Okay, so this is called par paramagnons. It's well known uh, from, uh, from helium-3 days. Okay, they, they, they used it to, uh, um, to get uh, pairing from spin fluctuations. In this case, it's intervalley coherent fluctuations, but it's, it's the very same physics and same, same diagram. Okay, so uh, uh, we can lump this uh, vertex and, and just call it uh, an effective IVC mediated interaction. And that interaction uh, has this form. If you, uh, if you look at zero frequency, so this would, should be Q and omega. In general, this is a dynamical interaction. Uh, it uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, just has this form, one over xi squared. Xi is the correlation length of the IVC fluctuations that, uh, that uh, should diverge if we're approaching a continuous a, a, a normal to IVC transition plus Q squared. Okay, and then uh, at finite frequency, as Andre mentioned, you have this Landau damping term. Yes. Yeah, so that, that doesn't exist for IVC because of the fact that it's actually a large Q. Okay, so you can say there, it's really, the Q is in this gamma, if you like. But Q, I'm, I'm sort of expanding, not really around Q equals zero. I've folded the two values on top of each other. So I, I called it Q equals zero, but it's actually not. Okay, so it's actually this large Q interval. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a simple Yukawa coupling between the electrons. Just like in spin fluctuations, it's actually repulsive in sign. Okay, but uh, it has exactly the right momentum structure to give you non-S wave pairing. Okay, and in fact, uh, you, do get, you, you do get the same P wave pairing as you got from charge fluctuations out of this interaction. Okay, and uh, a, right, as, as, uh, a, a, as was mentioned before, Okay, there's definitely experimental evidence that IVC phases exist in the phase diagram. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they're not confirmed uh, uh, right next to SC1 and SC2 in, in the trial layer. But uh, uh, um, we also saw from Steven sort of uh, hints for IVC, at least in bilayer. Um, now, um, let me just mention, okay, so um, we know that uh, some, some kind of uh, IVC or spiral IVC was actually uh, or, uh, confirmed in TVG, in, in twisted bilayer graphene, directly by STM. That's sort of the best way to look for these states because uh, they, these are really charge modulations on the carbon-carbon scale. You need an atomic scale probe to see them. Now, uh, in, in, uh, in these systems, unfortunately, we must have this huge displacement field, so we, we must work with, uh, with dual gates. So uh, that experiment is hard. So it's, I think there's an interesting open question in the field. How do we identify IVC order uh, definitively in these systems? Okay, so from, from just from macroscopic measurements. Um, okay, but uh, with, with that in mind, okay, let me, let me mention uh, a, a beautiful work that was done by uh, Ziyu, Ziyu Dong uh, and uh, Patrick Lee and uh, Leonid uh, uh, recently. Okay, so what they noted is the following fact. Okay, so uh, a, a consequence of this IVC mediated mechanism is that uh, you have these hotspots and uh, the interactions are really resonantly enhanced close to these hotspots. So that corresponds to backscattering, actually. It's, ex it's, exa it's exact backscattering of uh, um, electrons within the same valley. So uh, you have a, an electron from, from, uh, from valley K, uh, paired with an electron at valley K prime, and they simply switch places. That's, that's what this interaction corresponds to. This is why it favors P wave, it's repulsive in sign. So if the order parameter changes sign as you, uh, as you go from uh, P to minus P, P within the same valley, uh, uh, you gain from this interaction. Okay, but that also means that uh, if you lose these crossing points, you change density uh, and displacement field, and if you lose these crossing points, then uh, the, the, the uh, interaction should decrease dr uh, dramatically, and you should lo lose superconductivity. And uh, what they've done is uh, they've looked carefully at the, at, the, at the phase diagram. This is a bilayer graphene on, on uh, WSC2 and uh, it plotted uh, what the Fermi surfaces look like. And then they noticed that uh, uh, the superconducting phase sort of terminates abruptly 
it's some value of density and displacement field. And the claim is that that's exactly where you lose the crossing points between the Fermi surfaces from two valleys overlaid uh, on top of each other. Okay, and this actually works both in the system, this is bilayer graphene on WSC2, and also a, a, on, uh, a, in, in, in bilayer graphene without WSC2 uh, with an in-plane field. Okay, so uh, there, there is also a small sliver of superconductivity, and uh, the claim is that that terminates exactly where you lose these uh, crossing points between, fer between Fermi sheets from the two valleys. Yes? Yeah, so not, uh, that's, that's not very important. Okay, the way you should read it is on this side of the yellow line, you don't have crossing. On this side, you have crossing. Okay, so superconductivity should morally be restricted to this side. It's not quite, okay, but. Uh, is it determined based just on both spectral correlations? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so it's not model independent, but um, yeah. All right, so um, um, yeah, so uh, now, um, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, uh, nine minutes. Uh, nine minutes. So, uh, right. So, uh, then I'm debating whether I should uh, cycle back to singlet, singlet versus triplet or show, show you briefly something else. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, yeah, let, let me just make one, one comment on, uh, on this question of singlet versus triplet and then move to something else uh, very, very briefly. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, notice um, uh, subtlety here. Okay, so I've loosely called this state uh, intra, intra valley P wave because if I only look at the order parameter within va one valley, it definitely has angular momentum one. Okay, but uh, this state can actually be either singlet or triplet. And as, as we discussed before, uh, if you neglect the inter, inter, uh, uh, inter valley Huns coupling, uh, you would get that these two, two states are actually degenerate with each other. Okay, the reason for that is that uh, singlet versus triplet, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's related to whether the sign of the order parameter is the same or opposite in the two valleys. Okay, so that's independent of the shape of the order parameter within a single valley. Okay, if, if you like uh, one of these, uh, the singlet one is really D-wave when you look at the entire Brillouin zone, D-wave-like, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, tri the triplet one um, is, is a proper P-wave. Okay, so uh, uh, by the way, this is true also for an order parameter that doesn't change sign within a single valley. That can also be either singlet or triplet. Okay, so that, that by itself is not special. And as we discussed, if we only take the long range part of the Coulomb interactions into account, then there's this SU2 cross SU2 symmetry, which means that you can rotate the spin in valley K relative to the spin in valley K prime, uh, meaning that singlet and triplet are actually degenerate. Okay, and what would uh, lift this uh, degeneracy is this relatively small Huns term. And uh, as we discussed, that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem because we think that this Huns, Huns term should be ferromagnetic. And never, uh, 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 nevertheless, SC1 is a singlet. So why is it a singlet? Okay, so here comes an observation. Okay, if you think about the chiral uh, pairing, okay, so if the, uh, the, uh, the Cooper pair has angular momentum um, um, one, or actually anything but zero, the amplitude of the two electrons forming the, the Cooper pair from the two valleys to be in the same place in real space is actually zero. Okay, so that's simply because that's the integral over the pair wave function over in the entire K space. So that vanishes. Okay, so that means that the way I've written this Huns term, which is a short range term, it's a contact term, that actually vanishes for a Cooper pair that has angular momentum one. Okay, so uh, this term is actually completely ineffective. And if you write the, the gap equation, this, uh, this Huns term actually completely drops out. Okay, so uh, it actually doesn't even lift the degeneracy between singlet and triplet. Uh, okay, and that's good because now, uh, okay, maybe J determines that the normal state is a ferromagnet if, it, if, it, uh, if it's been polarized. Uh, but it doesn't uh, determine, it, it, it doesn't lift the degeneracy between singlet and triplet in the superconducting state. That would be determined by even finer details of the Huns interaction. You need to take into account the fact that the Huns interaction is not quite local in, in real space. Okay, still has some, some uh, a space dependent or equivalent, a, a state space dependence or equivalently some Q dependence. So you would say, uh, Ferromagnet versus uh, antiferromagnet is determined by the first term here, J, J naught. 
Uh, but singlet versus triplet is actually entirely determined by this J2. Okay, so uh, that can resolve our puzzle because that means that, um, okay, we can independently account for the fact that uh, the normal state has been polarized, but uh, uh, SC1 has been singlet. Okay, and it turns out that if you just solve the problem with, uh, with the long range Coulomb interactions, including the intervalley part, you actually get spin singlet pairing if, if the normal state is not spin polarized. Okay, so that can resolve this, the singlet versus uh, triplet uh, dichotomy. Okay, and uh, just in a few minutes, let me just flash uh, a few other results. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna um, uh, make a comment about uh, SC2. Okay, so SC2 is actually an interesting state but on its own, independently of all the other physics I've been discussing. And I've just want, I just want to mention this briefly. This is work done with these uh, um, gentlemen. Eyal is a former postdoc and Mark is a professor at University of Washington. Okay, so uh, a kind of glossed over it, but um, a spin triplet superconductivity is definitely around in these systems. And that's actually quite interesting on its own. You know, uh, among s superconductors and superfluids, maybe the best well-known uh, spin triplet superfluid is helium-3. And it's kind of been a long-term uh, long goal in the field to find a solid state analog of this, uh, of this state. Okay, so if a solid state material that has spin triplet pairing, there are many candidates, but uh, they're quite hard, hard to, find, to, to come by. And, uh, and these types of graphene systems are actually perfectly the right place in retrospect, of course, the right place to look. Okay, so why is that? What do we need in order to get a triplet pairing state? We need strong electron uh, interaction. Um, we need, uh, it's good to have a nearby ferromagnetic phase. Uh, and uh, the system has to be extremely clean for the reasons we discussed. And actually, all these, uh, all these conditions are ex exactly met in all of these graphene systems, right? We have all of these uh, prerequisites. Pre pre uh, so, um, so indeed, um, singlet and triplet seem to occur. Um, okay, and in addition, in the, in the systems on, on BN, spin orbit coupling is weak. Okay, it's not zero, it's, it's, uh, a, a, but um, a, to first approximation, let's, uh, let's uh, neglect it. And then uh, a, 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 spin, a, spin, a spin polarized triplet has this uh, interesting degree of freedom of the orientation of the spin, which is uh, free to rotate um, in spin space. And that can intertwine with superconductivity in, in, in an interesting way. Okay, so uh, uh, let me go quickly over something that actually Raphael explained in quite, quite a lot of detail. Okay, so if you think about the spin triplet order parameter, that's a multi-component order parameter, uh, as, as Raphael discussed. You have to specify not only the K dependence of the order parameter, but also the dependence on spin, okay? So you have, the order parameter is actually a matrix in spin space, and uh, it's convenient to parameterize it. Uh, Raphael didn't call it that way, but uh, in terms of this complex vector D, okay? The so-called D vector, it's a K dependent vector, and uh, it's simply the expectation value of the order parameter, including spin. Okay, so uh, this is a vector, and um, a, you, you write it in this way, okay, just to give you some uh, intuition. So a, the state we're interested in for SE2 is a particular type of triplet, right? So you can have M equals zero triplet, you can have M, M equals one triplet. This is the M equals one triplet in some direction, okay, where the spins a, a, along some quantization axis. So a, in terms of this complex D vector, it's a complex vector, so there's a real part D1 and a, a, a imaginary part D2, a, and uh, a, a, the fully spin polarized state corresponding to just two electrons with the same spin polarized along some direction corresponds in terms of this D vector to both D1 and D2 being uh, a, a non-zero. Their, their magnitudes are equal and their directions are orthogonal to each other. Okay, you can work this out explicitly. It's a really nice exercise to see this explicitly. You just plug this form in. So you take uh, D1 to be x hat, uh, d2 to be y hat, you plug this in, you find that uh, this corresponds to a pair with both electrons being up in the z direction. Okay, and then you can rotate that to be along any, any axis. Okay, so uh, we have an interesting order parameter here. Okay, so the order parameter, you can think about the order parameter ra rather than a, as a complex number with just a phase, you can think about the order parameter as a triad. Okay, you have these two orthogonal vectors um, uh, equal in magnitude, D1 and D2, and you have their, their uh, vector product, D1 cross D2, 
which is nothing but the direction of the, the spin magnetization of the Cooper pair. Okay, so for a, a d1 along x and dy along y, a, a, that would be z. That's the direction of the polarization. Okay, and if you do a gauge transformation, that's just multiplying the order parameter by complex phase, that corresponds to a rot rotation a, of this triad around the m direction. Okay, so of course that cannot change the direction of m. The direction of m is physical, that's the actual spin order parameter. Uh, but uh, d, uh, the directions of d1 and d2 are gauge dependent. They would rotate. Okay, and uh, 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 this has, of course, one immediate consequence um, that uh, you probably would have guessed even without all this dis discussion. Uh, for two dimensions, there should be no uh, finite temperature transition because uh, uh, this is not the u1 order parameter. There's no costless Taulis transition. This type of order parameter does not order in two dimensions at finite temperature. But uh, just like in, in um, a, a Heisenberg model in two dimensions, it would have a correlation length that decreases very, very rapidly, exponentially, uh, a, a, a upon lowering temperature. So uh, for, for all practical purposes for a finite system, you would essentially see an, a, a phase transition or a very, very, very rapid crossover um, a, at a certain temperature. Okay, but nevertheless, even, even, uh, even if you forget about the fact that there's no finite temperature to, um, um, transition, there's sort of an interesting consequence of this type of order parameter, and just want to touch upon that, and then I'll, I'll conclude. Okay, and that's uh, when you think about topological defects. Okay, so usually if you think about topological defects in a superconductor, you know that uh, if the order parameter is a complex phase, if you go around the point, you can count how many times the phase winds as you go around. Okay, so that would be some integer number of two pi's. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you can have any integer vorticity. So the uh, topological defects are characterized by an integer number, so the number of vortices inside some line. Now here, our order parameter is not the U1 phase, it's a triad. So it's actually equivalent to an SO3 matrix. Okay, it's a, ro ro a rotation matrix in three spatial dimensions. And uh, the, uh, the corresponding uh, homotopy uh, of, of uh, a, a SO3 is actually Z2. So that means that as, as you go around the point, uh, this uh, order parameter either winds or not. It can't wind twice. Okay? Winding twice is equivalent to not winding at all. Okay? There's not, there's not such, such a thing as two vortices in this system. There's either one vortex or nothing. And the statement is if you have two vortices and you try to bring them together, by twisting the spin, you can actually unwind the phase, unwind the superconducting phase. Okay? So that's a, something special to this type of order parameter to uh, demonstrate this mathematical fact is something nice called the Dirac belt trick. You can do it with a belt. I won't attempt it here. So I found this, uh, this nice uh, uh, animation. Okay, if you take a belt, twist it twice, and then fix the two ends and just move them in space, you can actually undo the winding. Okay, and that's, a demonstra that's related to this uh, mathematical fact uh, that the uh, pi one of SO3 is equal to Z2. If you do it once, you can't, you can't unwind it. In either way, you move you move the ends, okay? So, uh, uh, yeah, so what, what does that mean? Um, I'll just say it in one word. Okay, it basically means uh, that uh, the current, the, the, the critical current density in such a superconductor is zero. So in, for a finite system, this might look like a superconductor, but as you make this, this, the system bigger, the critical current would decrease like one over system size. Okay, and that's because you can unwind two phase twists by uh, winding the spin. And moreover, this, uh, this uh, critical current would, in, it would increase with an in-plane field, okay? Because that would pin the direction of the spin. So yeah, so pr probably over time, let me skip all of this and just show you the conclusions and thank you very much.